Chapter 23 During the six or seven days immediately following, we remained in our hiding place upon the hill, going out only occasionally, and then with the greatest precaution for water and filberts. We had made a kind of penthouse on the platform, furnishing it with a bed of dry leaves and placing in it three large flat stones, which served us for both fireplace and table. We kindled a fire without difficulty by rubbing two pieces of dry wood together, the one soft, the other hard. The bird we had taken in such good season proved excellent eating, although somewhat tough. It was not an oceanic fowl, but a species of bittern, with jet black and grizzly plumage, and diminutive wings in proportion to its bulk. We afterwards saw three of the same kind in the vicinity of the ravine, apparently seeking for the one we had captured, but, as they never alighted, we had no opportunity of catching them. As long as this fowl lasted, we suffered nothing from our situation, but it was now entirely consumed, and it became absolutely necessary that we should look out for provision. The filberts would not satisfy the cravings of hunger, afflicting us, too, with severe grippings of the bowels, and, if freely indulged in, with violent headache. We had seen several large tortoises near the seashore to the east of the hill, and perceived they might be easily taken, if we could get at them without the observation of the natives. It was resolved, therefore, to make an attempt at descending. We commenced by going down the southern declivity, which seemed to offer the fewest difficulties, but had not proceeded a hundred yards before, as we had anticipated from appearances on the hilltop. Our progress was now entirely arrested by a branch of the gorge in which our companions had perished. We now passed along the edge of this for about a quarter of a mile, when we were again stopped by a precipice of immense depth, and, not being able to make our way along the brink of it, we were forced to retrace our steps by the main ravine. We now pushed over to the eastward, but with precisely similar fortune. After an hour's scramble, at the risk of breaking our necks, we discovered that we had merely descended into a vast pit of black granite, with fine dust at the bottom, and whence the only egress was by the rugged path in which we had come down. Toiling again up this path, we now tried the northern edge of the hill. Here we were obliged to use the greatest possible caution in our maneuvers, as the least indiscretion would expose us to the full view of the savages in the village. We crawled along, therefore, on our hands and knees, and occasionally we were even forced to throw ourselves at full length, dragging our bodies along by means of the shrubbery. In this careful manner we had proceeded but a little way, when we arrived at a chasm far deeper than any we had yet seen, and leading directly into the main gorge. Thus our fears were fully confirmed, and we found ourselves cut off entirely from access to the world below. Thoroughly exhausted by our exertions, we made the best of our way back to the platform, and throwing ourselves upon the bed of leaves, slept sweetly and soundly for some hours. For several days after this fruitless search, we were occupied in exploring every part of the summit of the hill, in order to inform ourselves of its actual resources. We found that it would afford us no food, with the exception of the unwholesome filberts, and a rank species of scurvy grass, which grew in a little patch of not more than four rods square, and would be soon exhausted. On the 15th of February, as near as I can remember, there was not a blade of this left, and the nuts were growing scarce. Our situation, therefore, could hardly be more lamentable. On the 16th we again went round the walls of our prison in hope of finding some avenue of escape, but to no purpose. We also descended the chasm in which we had been overwhelmed, with the faint expectation of discovering through this channel some opening to the main ravine. Here, too, we were disappointed, although we found and brought up with us a musket. On the 17th, we set out with the determination of examining more thoroughly the chasm of black granite into which we had made our way in the first search. We remembered that one of the fissures in the side of this pit had been but partially looked into, and we were anxious to explore it, although with no expectation of discovering here any opening. We found no great difficulty in reaching the bottom of the hollow as before, and were now sufficiently calm to survey it with some attention. It was indeed one of the most singular-looking places imaginable, 
and we could scarcely bring ourselves to believe it altogether the work of nature. The pit, from its eastern to western extremity, was about five hundred yards in length, when all its windings were threaded, the distance from east to west in a straight line not being more, I should suppose having no means of accurate examination, than forty or fifty yards. Upon first descending into the chasm, that is to say, for a hundred feet downward from the summit of the hill, the sides of the abyss bore little resemblance to each other, and apparently had at no time been connected. The one surface being of the soapstone, and the other of marl, granulated with some metallic matter. The average breadth or interval between the two cliffs was probably here sixty feet, but there seemed to be no regularity of formation. Passing down, however, beyond the limit spoken of, the interval rapidly contracted, and the sides began to run parallel, although for some distance farther they were still dissimilar in their material and form of surface. Upon arriving within fifty feet of the bottom, a perfect regularity commenced. The sides were now entirely uniform in substance, in color, and in lateral direction, the material being a very black and shining granite, and the distance between the two sides at all points facing each other exactly twenty yards. The precise formation of the chasm will be best understood by means of a delineation taken upon the spot, for I had luckily with me a pocket-book and pencil, which I preserved with great care through a long series of subsequent adventure, and to which I am indebted for memoranda of many subjects, which would otherwise have been crowded from my remembrance. This figure gives the general outline of the chasm, without the minor cavities in the sides, of which there were several, each cavity having a corresponding protuberance opposite. The bottom of the gulf was covered to the depth of three or four inches with a powder almost impalpable, beneath which we found a continuation of the black granite. To the right, at the lower extremity, will be noticed the appearance of a small opening. This is the fissure alluded to above, and to examine which more minutely than before was the object of our second visit. We now pushed into it with vigor, cutting away a quantity of brambles which impeded us, and removing a vast heap of sharp flints somewhat resembling arrowheads in shape. We were encouraged to persevere, however, by perceiving some little light proceeding from the farther end. We at length squeezed our way for about thirty feet, and found that the aperture was a low and regularly formed arch, having a bottom of the same impalpable powder as that in the main chasm. A strong light now broke upon us, and turning a short bend, we found ourselves in another lofty chamber, similar to the one we had left in every respect but longitudinal form. Its general figure here is given. The total length of this chasm, commencing at the opening, A, and proceeding round the curve, B, to the extremity, D, is 550 yards. At C, we discovered a small aperture similar to the one through which we had issued from the other chasm and this was choked up in the same manner with brambles and a quantity of white arrowhead flints. We forced our way through it, finding it about forty feet long, and emerged into a third chasm. This, too, was precisely like the first, except in its longitudinal shape, which was thus. We found the entire length of the third chasm three hundred and twenty yards. At the point A was an opening about six feet wide, and extending fifteen feet into the rock, where it terminated in a bed of marl, there being no other chasm beyond as we had expected. We were about leaving this fissure, into which very little light was admitted, when Peters called to my attention a range of singular-looking indentures in the surface of the marl, forming the termination of the cul-de-sac. With a very slight exertion of the imagination, the left, or most northern, of these indentures might have been taken for the intentional although rude representation of a human figure standing erect with outstretched arms. The rest of them bore also some little resemblance to alphabetical characters, and Peter was willing, at all events, to adopt the idle opinion that they were really such. I convinced him of his error finally, by directing his attention to the floor of the fissure, where among the powder we picked up, piece by piece, several large flakes of the marl, which had evidently been broken off by some convulsion from the surface, where the indentures were found, and which had projecting points exactly fitting the indentures, thus proving them to have been the work of nature. 
After satisfying ourselves that these singular caverns afforded us no means of escape from our prison, we made our way back, dejected and dispirited, to the summit of the hill. Nothing worth mentioning occurred during the next twenty-four hours, except that, in examining the ground to the eastward of the third chasm, we found two triangular holes of great depth, and also with black granite sides. Into these holes we did not think it worth while to attempt descending, as they had the appearance of mere natural wells without outlet. They were each about twenty yards in circumference, and their shape as well as relative position in regard to the third chasm is shown in figure five. 